I now want to formally introduce our guests at this Defend the Whistleblowers Lunch. Uh, starting with my immediate right, Richard Boyle is a former, as many of you would know, ATO staffer who exposed awful, absolutely shocking wrongdoing inside the tax office. And for his uh, alleged sins, he is facing court and facing the prospect of 161 years in prison for blowing the whistle on some disturbing practices in the ATO. Uh, next to Richard is uh, Del Ferguson, who really needs no introduction, but I'll give her a quick one anyway. Uh, uh, with The Age and Sydney Morning Herald, uh, multiple award-winning journalist uh, who has, uh, through whistleblowers, not just with Richard, uh, but uh, in other companies and other sections of government has exposed wrongdoing as well. I'm talking about the CBA, 7-Eleven. You know her work. Uh, she has uh, utilised whistleblowers uh, tremendously. And uh, next to Adele is Senator Rex Patrick of the Centre Alliance, uh, about to be a very important man in the new parliament. Uh, his vote is going to be absolutely crucial to uh, the government, getting not just tax legislation through, but also, as you'll hear very shortly, uh, stuff that he wants to achieve, and that includes greater protection for people like Richard and greater media freedoms in this country. Before we uh, start the discussion, I also want to acknowledge in the audience Paul Murphy, the uh, Chief Executive of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, uh, who along with the Press Club is uh, uh, fighting a very vigorous fight on behalf of uh, journalists, uh, particularly in the wake of the AFP raids on the ABC and Annika Smethurst place, uh, to uh, reassert the importance of media freedom and the importance of whistleblowing in this country. So Paul, we appreciate your efforts, thank you. And also, I won't be able to answer every tricky legal question, so I'll be tapping uh, over the course of the lunch, if needed, one of this country's leading media lawyers, Justin Quill, uh, who was on the top table here. Now, Justin, as you may know, is a bit shy. He's a bit shy around microphones. He, he doesn't like exposure, but I might just have to gently uh, goad him to uh, give some expert advice on uh, some constitutional and legal aspects. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick off with some questions, uh, but please, uh, as we go on, uh, don't hesitate to raise your arms uh, and uh, I'll, I'll hand the microphone over to you. There are roving microphones in the audience to ask questions of any of our panel. I want to start with uh, Richard uh, in, in a potted form uh, for those who may not know. I'm sure most people do, but I explain what you did in the tax office and the penalties you are facing for doing what you did. Thanks, Michael. Um, <clears throat> well, I was in the tax office for 14 years, um, primarily in the debt business line, and that involved working with uh, the community, mainly small business, uh, medium business individuals, trusts, and helping them through difficult times uh, in the tax office. If they, uh, a lot of people would go through life, you know, difficult life circumstances, as you can imagine, being a public servant, whether you're a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or, or any other public service, you see the cross-section of, of what happens to people. So we, we had a dual task. We had a task of uh, administering tax legislation and sometimes being compassionate and removing interest from people's accounts and assisting them back to what the tax officer's position was, which was willing participation. And that worked very well. And then on occasion when people wouldn't comply with the law, we had the powers to, um, after fair warning and fair negotiation, do things like uh, a point in time garnish here, which is a snapshot. So if someone wouldn't pay their tax and clearly refused to pay their fair share and support the community, uh, we could send that under tax legislation. And then if people still didn't respond, that would just maybe grab some money out of their account with the Commonwealth Bank or the NAB or whatever. And then only after many months would we take what the most serious uh, compliance action that we had, or one of them, which was a standard garnishee or an enduring garnishee. And that really shut down a person's bank account for three months. In a, in a sense, you were shutting a business down. And so we would have to take that um, action very carefully and very diligently. So in early June 2017, when we were given a directive from what appeared to be, and we were told was from the very top of the organisation, to take that enduring garnishee action on every case that came across our desk a month before the end of the financial year, um, I think I was rightly horrified and astounded at the audacity of, of that directive. Uh, many of my very experienced and, and wonderful colleagues in debt um, also expressed dismay. And then really the pressure started cracking down on me until I was walked out of the organisation on the 6th of September and lodged a public interest disclosure under the Act, uh, which 
shockingly at the moment has to be sent to the very department that I was working for. And uh, sort of the rest has really evolved from there. So you, you, uh, you, used, you tried to use internal processes first? Oh, look, the, the timing, I won't go into too much of the timing, it is yep. in the public sphere, but I was walked out of the office before I made the public interest disclosure, technically. Um, but really, the, the, the fact that I was walked out uh, while speaking out against what was a clear unethical directive, I think, speaks for itself. Mm. And uh, so well, what do you think, therefore, of that uh, circulating back to the tax office now, you going through, us utilising the public interest disclosure mechanism, the fact that the tax office now gets another say on that? Uh, how, can you please explain the question? So you, you use the Public Interest Disclosure Act. So what, so what happens next after? What happened next after that? Okay, so I was being run through what I would call um, a spurious breach of the Code of Conduct allegations. Um, there were attempts to negotiate with the Commissioner of Taxation directly to uh, stem that and keep the uh, the disclosures in house. Um, in late January 2018, I was offered tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money that I wasn't entitled to to remain silent and to sign a non disclosure. Uh, that really didn't wash with me. Of course, it's a very difficult decision when you're engaged for you know, your, your partner and your life partner, and you've got your family and your, her parents and my parents worrying about how, how we're going to get through this. But it was clear that I was under a huge amount of pressure and that the organisation was cracking down. And then when uh, Four Corners, um, when we got in contact, uh, there was, again, swift retribution and I had been on a, uh, a paid leave investigation which turned into an unpaid leave investigation and I was um, unceremoniously uh, terminated on the 1st of May 2018. Uh, you, I've talked about the heavy, heavy penalty you're facing. Where, where is it now in the courts? How long before you get a chance to argue your case again before the courts? Uh, well, look, of course I can't comment on particulars of, yep. of the matter, but uh, I've had three hearings so far. I have made a um, deferral to the District Court of Australia, uh, sorry, District Court of South Australia, um, as opposed to the Magistrate Court, which where the matter is now. There'll be another hearing or two before heading over to that jurisdiction. And before I want to bring uh, Adele and Rex in, uh, you touched on that, but uh, just take us through, I know it's very potentially challenging for you to talk about it, but the, the immense personal financial and emotional impact this has had on you for doing something which is right, blowing the whistle on bad practice? Look, last year was a, an absolute shocking year. Um, it, it's been hard for Louise to watch me um, go through a real decline in health. You know, when um, in Adele's article, when I said I felt like uh, they could have killed me, I, I say that quite literally. I mean, if I'd you know, not woken up one day, I wouldn't have been surprised with the, the level of mental stress. Um, but what I exposed, um, it was really important for me to tell the truth and to write it down as clearly and as concisely as I could uh, in my disclosure. And it's a very comprehensive document that Senator Patrick is trying to access at the moment. Um, things are slightly better this year, but then the charges came and it's really a, a roller coaster ride. And Louise and I just try to support each other, go day by day. Um, Sometimes we don't know how we're going to pay the rent. We've had some donations privately. So the, the community support has been overwhelming and fantastic. And just quickly, I, I, to give the audience an indication of how uh, much your life is restricted now, tell us what you actually had to go through to be physically here today. Uh, well, in the last hearing, um, about three or four weeks ago after our wedding, uh, a bail condition was put on um, my travel interstate. Um, so I had a hearing late last week to apply uh, through my Legal Services Commission lawyer and solicitor to get permission to travel. Um, at that time, uh, the DPP uh, tried to put a restriction on me that I would have to report back to a police station when I got back to Adelaide. Uh, the magistrate kindly didn't comply with that DPP request, uh, so I appreciate his support. Um, so it, it's. It's really quite extraordinary to not be able to travel into state, and that, that condition expires at the end of next month. With my next hearing, so I'll have to reapply. So, Dell, uh, you've obviously worked with Richard in helping him uh, give wider ventilation to what he saw and heard inside the Australian Tax Office. What insight does his case give about the, uh, the, the, the awful circumstance faced by many whistleblowers in this country? Well, I think, you know, that he's facing so many years in jail and, and that is, you know, they are whistleblowers I've dealt with, mainly, mainly corporate whistleblowers, and they end up um, losing their job. Uh, they, you know, in 
Jeff Morris's case, the CBA whistleblower, he ended up with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, his marriage broke down, he, can't, he hasn't been able to get a full-time job since then, and that was, you know, 2009. S same with Dr Coe, who was a um, common shore whistleblower who blew the whistle on life insurance. He lodged an internal whistleblowing policy with the Commonwealth Bank, uh, thinking that because of what happened with Jeff Morris, they'd learnt their lesson because they had relaunched their whistleblowing policy. And again, they looked to find something that would um, enable them to terminate him, and they did. So it's never a good story. It's either legal action, it's losing your job. It, yeah, your life is turned upside down. So the law is clearly a joke, which leads us to the Australian Parliament. Uh, Rex Patrick, <laughs> what are you trying to do to change all of this? Well, there's a, a, a number of things that I'm doing, both in Richard's case and also from a legislative perspective. Um, I think we just need to recognise at the very start uh, that whistleblowers promote integrity, they deter misconduct, uh, and uh, they must be protected uh, at, uh, you know, in, in, in doing that. Um, when they do blow the whistle, we would expect that that ends in, uh, or, or the result of that is the, uh, the conduct ceases and people are dealt with. Uh, it's a really, really important uh, um, part of not just the public sector, but also the private sector. Uh, in the last parliament, um, uh, I, fortunately I was an advisor to Nick Xenophon and when the registered organisation uh, legislation was going through the parliament in late 2015, uh, uh, we, uh, Centre Alliance, uh, reached an agreement with the government to reform whistleblower protection laws, not just in that particular act, but then to move to the corporate sector and then to come back around and tidy up the, the public sector. Uh, I spent um, the last uh, year or so uh, uh, I, mud wrestling with, uh, with Kelly O'Dwyer, worked really, really positively with her actually, getting some really good uh, whistleblower protection laws in place that have now passed through the parliament. Uh, they're laws that now do allow for, uh, f for people dis to disclose anonymously, uh, it uh, provides for compensation, not just direct compensation, but indirect, so where mental um, harm is caused, uh, uh, the compensation uh, can be granted. A lot more uh, of, the, of the burdens uh, shift, uh, so in, in a circumstance where someone loses their job, you simply have to show that you lost your job, and then all the burden switches to the company to uh, prove that that job loss was not associated with the, with the whistleblowing. Uh, so there's a, a range of new protections in place now in the corporate sector. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, that had uh, Richard um, uh, disclosed under those particular conditions, he'd be in a much, much better position now. We need to now change the public sector, the Public Interest Disclosure Act. That's the next cab off the rank. Uh, that was in the agreement with Centre Alliance, uh, signed off back in 2016. And I have, over the last couple of weeks, on a couple of occasions, talked to uh, Matthias uh, Corman. And you, you might have noticed in the, in the last few days, uh, reported by Adele, uh, uh, Christian Porter, the Attorney General, has indicated that the government will move forward and we will get protections, further protections put in place for public service uh, uh, whistleblowers. So that's, uh, that's on the agenda. Uh, the, the government uh, will work with uh, Centre Alliance to uh, improve those laws so that at the very least we have the same baseline for registered organisations, the corporate sector and the public uh, sector. It's a real problem. Right now we have uh, whistleblower laws in the public sector that lure people into thinking they can make a disclosure only to find that there's no real protection. And that in some sense is worse than having no whistleblower protection at all. Uh, so we have to fix it. Uh, how confident are you of seeing that happening, the greater protection for public interest whistleblowers, and given the fact that you do hold or control two very important crucial votes in the Senate, are you prepared to uh, use that as leverage uh, when it comes to other legislation like tax cuts or other bills the government wants to get through the Senate with Centre Alliance's support? Uh, the, the leverage uh, that we might have over the government in respect of uh, 
uh, our vote in the, in the Senate is is not just tied to legislation. It can be tied to procedures uh, and other other things that happen in background. Uh, I'm very confident that we will uh, progress towards changing and improving public interest disclosure laws for public servants. I'm, I'm very, very confident of that. Adele, uh, having been in this space for quite, uh, quite a number of years now, how does the uh, plight of whistleblowers in Australia compared to whistleblowers in other countries, for instance, the United States? Well, I think in the United States, they, they have a whistleblower day to celebrate them. Mm. Uh, there's rewards. So just last year, uh, three whistleblowers at Merrill Lynch got 80 odd million dollars as a reward. You know, so if you had the, if, if that was applied here, you'd have the 7-Eleven whistleblower who um, $150 million was paid back uh, to workers. He would have got a, a, a cut of that, you know, as, as a thank you for exposing wrongdoing and, you know, for the good of the community. That doesn't happen in this country. So the whistleblowers tend to be treated like pariahs and they still are. So we, we really have a long way to go compared to, say, the United States. And can I, can I just say that blowing the whistle... Oh, sorry, providing a bounty to whistleblowers is not about making whistleblowers rich. It's about making sure that every CEO, every secretary of a department know that there are people who, who, can, who are financially motivated to call out misconduct, and that stops it happening in the first place. Richard, were you, uh, as, as the senator said, uh, uh, lured uh, under, uh, uh, by these protections you thought might have been in place in the corporates in the public sector? In this case, the ATO. Did you know of any protections available to you before you decided to uh, speak up? Uh, as a junior employee in the Australian Taxation Office, I can't say I had read the Public Interest Disclosure Act. I certainly have now. Um, so it, it was really a journey of of someone. Uh, in my position, doing community work on the coal face, seeking to do what was right for the community, uh, and that is seeking to ensure that people with compassion and difficulties, as I was saying before, many people go through in the community when you're dealing with thousands of people, making sure that they are treated fairly. And on the other um, hand, mind you, making sure that people who are clearly uh, being allowed to let off uh, or being let off with not paying their fair share of tax, which I saw mm. uh, extensively as well, um, with those sorts of things, I was just really pushed through uh, the circumstance of having that directive given to me. So I, I wasn't really making any calculations um, as to what my protections were. I went through a process, was guided by my legal advice at the time to make the disclosure under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Uh, and then, shockingly, it was rejected two weeks after. I mean, I wrote a 27-page, 12,000-word report, which was cited heavily. And as I said, I tried to make it as accurate and comprehensive as possible. So it was really shocking when it was rejected by the Australian Taxation Office. It must have been a huge slap in the face, and we can't talk about the, the particulars of your case, but we do know, uh, Rex Patrick, that Christian Porter, as the Attorney General, does have the power to stop the prosecution of Richard Boyle, and you have personally lobbied the Attorney General to do that. How far have you got? Well, there's a few things I'm trying to do in the Parliament to help Richard out, uh, which is separate to the general things that we need to do to protect whistleblowers. Um, uh, one of the things I'm doing uh, is uh, next week I will lodge what's called an order for production of documents, like a subpoena, to uh, get access to what happened inside the tax office between when Richard put in his public interest, interest disclosure, which I have read. Um, I'm not going to tell you how I read that. Uh, uh, and the AFP, you're welcome to come and visit my offices, but I will be claiming privilege over that. Um, the uh, uh, what happened between when he lodged that disclosure and uh, when they decided that it wasn't disclosable conduct. Um, I'm absolutely convinced it was. Uh, and it appears the uh, Inspector General of Taxation and uh, Kate Carnell and others that have looked at this uh, would tend to agree with me. So we need to find out what happened in Richard's case uh, when they processed his public interest disclosure. Um, I'm expecting a little bit of resistance from the tax office, but ultimately the Senate has the power to demand the documents uh, from an oversight perspective. Um, uh, just in relation to the request that I've made of, of, uh, of the Attorney General, the Attorney General uh, does have a power to um, stop a prosecution if it is not in the public interest. That's in Section 71, brackets 1 of the uh, Judiciary Act. Uh, I cannot fathom in my mind 
how you can have someone who's blowing the whistle uh, and uh, there have been uh, a number of inquiries that have revealed anomalies, and I use that's probably the kindest word I could, I could use, uh, that have resulted in changes to the way the tax office does its business, and yet the whistleblower who, who applied for or, or, or um, uh, lodged a public interest disclosure uh, is now being uh, prosecuted for activities that may be related to the way in which he, he prepared his disclosure. Um, no government can seriously um, say that they are interested in protecting whistleblowers and then let this prosecution stand. So I'm not going to whether Richard is guilty or not guilty. That is, not, that is a matter for the courts. Uh, what, I, what I am criticising is the executive decision to prosecute. And I'm still talking to government about uh, that particular decision, and uh, um, that that's. And I will end up, uh, no doubt, talking to others in the parliament, including my my uh, crossbench colleagues as well. Uh, I'm not trying to pervert the course of justice. It just does not seem uh, rational, sensible in any way, shape, or form to prosecute someone who blew the whistle on on misconduct that no one doubts was occurring. I'll toss it over to questions in just a moment, but this leads us into the broader issue of uh, media freedom in Australia. Adele, as somebody uh, who's been a journalist for many years standing, how much more challenging is it to be a journalist, to do the basic things a journalist should be doing, uh, speaking truth to power, shining the spotlight on bad behaviour? How much tougher is it to do it in 2019 compared to previous years? Well, it's, it's extremely tough. You just saw a few weeks ago um, raids of two media organisations. Uh, defamation laws are just really restrictive. Suppression orders when we're in a digital age. There's so many things. I can't count how many things restrict um, press freedom. It's just getting out of control. And then the whistleblowing. Many, many journalists argue that uh, the archaic defam defamation laws, and they are purely archaic, uh, certainly compared to other countries, uh, are much more insidious than national security legislation when it comes to restricting what journalists can do. Do you, do you see it that way, or do you think there are other uh, controls that are stopping us doing our jobs? Look, I think they're both really bad. Um, you know, speaking from personal experience with uh, defamation, you know, you get these spurious statements of claim with allegations that weren't even in the stories and you have to defend them. And that's where it just becomes insane. You know, even if you look like you're going to win or you've got all the proof, um, it's just so difficult to, to argue your case. Uh, I know, Senator Patrick, you're uh, being active on this front as well in the Senate, uh, moving with legislation to strengthen protections for journalists. So what are you up to on that front? Okay, so next week I will also uh, um, table a bill in the Parliament uh, proposing a referendum uh, to the Constitution that introduces a First Amendment uh, style provision for freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Um, now, that will of course get referred off to a, a committee. It will uh, uh, kick along the debate. But uh, I'm of the view that uh, we've gone way too far, uh, particularly in relation to national security uh, legislation. National security exists for a purpose. It's a means to an end, and that end is to protect our democracy. If we don't have press freedom, we don't have a democracy. We have to get the, the balance right. If I, if I look back at what happened uh, uh, in relation to these particular raids, the starting point the, the, the cause of this problem was that at no stage should have the, the, the fact that uh, our uh, soldiers in Afghanistan uh, you know, being alleged to have uh, committed unlawful murders, at no stage should that have ever been held secret from the public. At no stage should we ever have held secret from the public that the Secretary of Defence and the Secretary of Home Affairs were having a discussion about using ASD uh, to, uh, you know, on, on Australian shores. They're just things that should never have been withheld from you. We've got broken FOI laws. We've got broken uh, uh, whistleblower laws. We're now having the media being intimidated. And it, and it looks like uh, it, it's now uh, game on to ring politicians to intimidate them as well. So uh, 
um, you know, I think it's time that we introduced something at a constitutional level that will um, uh, cause a rethink of all of the laws that sit underneath that and of course any law that would, uh, would be uh, in existence now that was inconsistent with a new provision in the Constitution would be invalid and uh, I think that's a way of cleaning through the system. Okay, and what, uh, based on early soundings, what prospect of support is there? I mean, we know where the government stands. Where, where do the other players stand on what you're proposing? Well, I'm hoping I'll get uh, the bill referred to an inquiry. Uh, that's a normal process and it would be very odd that a bill uh, not be uh, referred to a legislative committee of the, of the Senate, uh, which, will, which will kick along the debate. And then I guess it depends on the quality of, of the input and uh, I might need a little bit, a bit of media assistance along the way to, to promote the idea that this, is, uh, this, this would be a good thing. Um, I, I know people look at me and say, Rex, uh, referendums are hard, okay? I, I don't do things because they're easy, I do them because they're right, and we need to take some action on this. It's really, really important. Uh, um, uh, Thomas Jefferson said uh, once uh, that given the choice between having uh, government uh, uh, without newspapers or newspapers without government, you take the latter. And before I th throw out, I, I like that quote, before we throw it out to questions, uh, Richard, as, as a whistleblower, how important is it to you that uh, uh, you would know you, a situation where there'd be much greater freedom for journalists in Australia to report on wrongdoing that uh, whistleblowers like you will bring into the public sphere? Uh, well, Adele has, um, in my opinion, done a fantastic job of assisting me bringing this issue to light with Four Corners. Um, I mean, it, it does raise the issue at the moment uh, whether many of my colleagues in the Australian Taxation Office or any other public service department would feel comfortable uh, bringing their issues forward. And unfortunately, um, with what has happened to me, uh, that they probably don't feel particularly comfortable at the moment. So I'm looking forward to um, what Rex Patrick is doing uh, in the Parliament in, in improving the Public Interest Disclosure Act, because to me, it, it just simply didn't work at the moment. Okay, I'm sure there are lots of uh, questions. Uh, please uh, put up your hand and if you can just say uh, your name and who you're with. There's a microphone at the back, sir, at the, f at the front of the, uh, the room here. Uh, questions either on uh, the situation facing whistleblowers or media freedom. Uh, thank you. Uh, my uh, question is to the panel. Uh, one of the themes here is that um, there's uh, whistleblower protection laws are sorely needed, uh, but the, in, in a sense they're uh, I think um, misplaced because they actually, unless you have a will to enforce the laws, these whistle prote whistleblower protection laws are actually extremely dangerous because people are lulled into a poor sense of security that they will be protected. And at the moment, there's nobody who will actually come to your aid if you are a whistleblower. Now, if you go to ASIC or APRA and blow the whistle, you know, they hate you because you're interrupting their cosy little relationships they have with the big business. Now, one of my colleagues attempted to blow the whistle on a major fraud in a superannuation fund. And APRA, he thought he would be protected by the Superannuation Industry Superannuation Act, which has whistleblower protection already written into it. And APRA should have joined in this case. And uh, the junior people at APRA uh, talk, talked to my colleague and they said they're all supportive of APRA, should have joined in this case. But when it got to the top brass, uh, they shut it down. And so APRA sent along observers to, to uh, a, a proceedings in the um, Supreme Court of Victoria uh, and the employer, of course he was sacked for trying to blow the whistle, uh, the em employer, uh, witnesses committed perjury, uh, documents, were, uh, material evidence was concealed from the court and even when this all came out later, nobody wants to go and reopen that case. Mm. It's just all to an em a big embarrassment and I think this is what everybody who considers blowing the whistle uh, needs to take into account that nobody will come to help them when they blow the whistle. And I think, uh, you know, Richard has found out the hard way uh, yep. this is the case. And I think any legislation that's put forward to improve whistleblower protection laws has to have a caveat that there has to be some uh, defined willingness to enforce those laws. Uh, well, and I think that needs to be considered uh, in, in a great detail. So I'd like the, uh, the comments of the panel on that well, point. Well, I just want to... I'll, I'll start with uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, with the... the whistleblowers, uh, the legislation protecting private sector whistleblowers is about to come into force. Uh, is there that enforcement there? Is there that willingness to, to enforce those protections? 
it's always really difficult uh, in a whistleblower case because it's always the little guy against the really big entity, whether it be a government entity or a, a private sector entity. Uh, in my discussions with the government behind the scenes, I, I made it very clear to them that um, where they were trying to get or, or uh, uh, write legislation, uh, it had to be such that the corporation was always on the back foot. The, 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 the benefit was always given to the little guy. And that's one of the ways in which we cast the legislation, the new legislation for the corporate sector. So, so that if, if there's any doubt, uh, it's always the, the big corporation that has the doubt about where they stand. And there are other things that, we are, uh, that we've put into legislation like no cost uh, orders against a, a whistleblower in, in these sorts of cases. So there are some things we're doing, and, and the last thing I'll say is that one of the recommendations of the Joint Parliamentary Committee into whistleblowing in the uh, corporate and public sectors uh, recommended a whistleblower protection authority, uh, and uh, they may be able to step in, the, in, in, in these sorts of situations, and uh, that's something I will, of course, be bringing up. Uh, that whistleblower report from the Joint Parliamentary Committee was bipartisan, and hopefully we can get some traction on, on the concept of a whistleblower protection authority. Do either of you want to... Yeah, uh, look, I, I agree with you, and I think it goes back to the point I was making before. You need to actually change the mindset in corporations because the new whistleblower laws that come into effect July 1 still are flawed, meaning that if the organisation wants to go after you and terminate you, they will still find a way. So there needs to be a change in the mindset, as in the US where whistleblowers are revered. You know, they're seen as doing a, a public service, and that's really what needs to happen in this country. We need to change our mindset about whistleblowers and and really respect them, look at them, reward them, and then corporations will change as well, I believe. Everyone needs to be looking at the man sitting uh, two seats to the left of me and understanding he's a, he's a national hero. I would just add very briefly that the current Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 does have provisions for retribution against an employee that is uh, terminated um, or has any retributive action that is seen, perceived to be, or followed through. And that protection is currently in the Act, um, carrying a two-year jail term, I might add. Thanks for the question. Uh, we'll come to you in a second, Robert. We've got a question over uh, on the far table. Yes, and one behind you. Hi there. Um, thank you again just for coming. Um, I really appreciate hearing all of you speak. Um, I'm Julia, by the way. Um, so I feel like this discussion about the laws that affect both journalists and um, whistleblowers are coming a little bit late um, when you consider, um, you know, legislation about metadata and such that, you know, have had provisions to protect journalists and I think journalists, well the question is, have journalists been too concerned with their own safety around metadata that we have forgotten, I guess, the people who you know, we're supposed to protect who are our whistleblowers and our sources. And this is a question for all three people. Well, I know from, you know, just speaking personally, uh, you know, The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald has been fighting for whistleblowers for years. We've had stories on the front page, you know, calling for better whistleblower laws for many, many years. So I, I don't think we're guilty of that. During the, uh, the changes to the uh, Telecommunications uh, Access uh, Act um, back when they were changing the metadata laws, everyone remembers George Brandis um, explaining what metadata was. Uh, Nick, Nick Xenophon, uh, my, my predecessor, had put into those laws a, meta, uh, a, a protection for journalists. So right now, uh, if, the, if, a, if the police want to access the metadata of uh, a person, uh, they can simply get a senior officer to, to, to sign a, a form and uh, that, that occurs. Uh, there were protections put in place. There is now a, there is a journalist information warrant uh, 
if the person they're interested in is a journalist and uh, there's a much greater burden. Uh, you can't just go to, to a, a senior police officer, you must go to the attorney. The attorney must engage a public interest advocate uh, and that public interest advocate will of course argue the public interest case not to, not to grant the, the, the information warrant before uh, the police can get access. Now it, it's uh, a, one of the questions I'll be asking in the Senate once the AFP come before um, the Senate next time around, whether it be for a dedicated inquiry or at estimates, is why uh, in the case of Annika um, Smedhurst and indeed the ABC, they simply didn't very quietly go behind the scenes, get an, an, an information warrant uh, and uh, do their business without uh, marching into, into offices and, and rumbling through um, uh, drawers. And uh, I, I just, I, it really makes me wonder whether the burden, the protection that we put in place for journalist sources, and that's what that law was about, it wasn't about the journalists so much as their sources, we accept, the parliament has accepted that there needs to be a protection for your sources. Um, for some reason the police in this instance avoided going down that pathway and uh, that is a question that I, I want to have answered in the Senate. Uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, with this, this question here for Robert first. Um, Robert Gottlieb from the Australian. <coughs> Uh, Senator Patrick, um, uh, well done on the whistle bar, but are you aware that the Australian Tax Office is already two or three jumps ahead? Uh, and through the previous government, uh, the coalition government, um, they have running through the preliminary stages a dramatic increase in their power. Um, they will introduce the French system of guilty uh, and before you uh, prove yourself in innocent, uh, substantial increases in penalties, uh, the end of any legal co um, confidentiality with your legal advisor and things like that. And that legislation is moving towards the parliament. Will you do everything in your power to stop it? Obviously any legislation that is put in uh, to the parliament is designed to solve a controversy and that sort of goes previously to, to your question as well as we tend to follow rather than uh, predict what's going to happen. Uh, in all circumstances, when this sort of legislation comes up, uh, where, where extra powers are granted, uh, they're the sorts of things we would refer to a uh, to a, a committee so that we can hear all of the concerns and all the all of the benefits. Uh, but I, I think we need to be mindful of what's happened in the national security front, where we've just had all of this legislation going through without due regard to some of the consequences of that in terms of people's freedoms and uh, giving people uh, uh, considerable power, a lot of it exercised in secret, uh, which is hugely problematic. So um, I'd have to look at the legislation, but uh, I'd be very, I'm, I'm very mindful of, of uh, what's going on in the tax office. Right now I'm pressing for a, uh, for a self-referred inquiry uh, from the Senate Economics Committee into the Inspector General of Taxation, who I don't think did a very good job uh, in uh, investigating the Garnaschi notices. I mean, imagine conducting an inquiry, turning up to the Adelaide Tax Office to uh, find out what might have been going on there and every witness that uh, was, or every person that, that uh, gave evidence to the Inspector General of Taxation was accompanied by a taxation support officer. Uh, having these people having just watched uh, w what had happened to Richard getting marched out of uh, out of the office, how forthcoming would those those people have been in the presence of a senior ATO ATO officer? There's there's a whole bunch of uh, you know th um, things we need to be very very careful of. I undertake to uh, examine every piece of controversial legislation that comes forward using the, the Senate committee process system uh, and we do have to strike the right balance, uh, making sure the tax office can recover taxes from uh, you know, particularly large multinationals, but, but uh, making sure we protect people's interests as well. Okay, uh, we'll go to Michael, then we'll work our way back to the end of the room. Michael. Sorry. Michael Batchelard. So currently we've got the right of politics, if you like, broadly talking about religious freedom and a legislation, a religious freedom act. You've got other people, including journalists, talking about a press freedom act, uh, perhaps that the, the right of politics may not be quite so keen on. Is there any way of kind of putting these into some broader thing about a, a, a rights 
one might call it a Bill of Rights, or uh, a human rights charter, something like that, that protects the rights of a lot of different people rather than just narrow bands of people. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Rex? Um, so, in considering what I was going to do in relation to press freedom, uh, a Bill of Rights would seem to be uh, a nice place to put something uh, like that. However, the problem is a Bill of Rights is extensive in terms of its scope and would, uh, as it has in the past, I think Andrew Wilkie put a bill to the Parliament uh, a number of years ago, uh, these bills tend to get sort of bogged down in the sand. And uh, uh, so my immediate concern following the raids, following, following what we have seen in the last few weeks, is we have a pressing need that requires a, you know, a relatively narrow adjustment to, uh, in my view, our constitution. Uh, so I like the Bill of Rights idea, but being pragmatic and understanding how long these things take, I think there's an urgency uh, in, involved in the freedom of press and freedom of uh, expression issue, and, uh, and, and hence a, a narrow focus is, is the pathway that I'm proposing. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Suki, and pretty much that was my question as well. But I'd just like to add on on that, that, and I had raised a similar question on Q and A two weeks back, and it was on press freedom. That in an era of fake news and dis disinformation and propaganda, today from Philippines to New York, if you are an investigative journalist and you're reporting something against the government or a large business like Seven Eleven, you are in big trouble. And so. In the backdrop, I'm sure everyone in this room knows who was Jamal Khashoggi and what happened to him and what is happening right now at the ABC and the journalist at AFP Raid. So do we need a constitutionally recognized Press Freedom Act to protect investigative journalists? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, over, over, yes, over there. I might, uh, in a moment as well, ask you, Justin, just to explain the the raids, the AFP raids, uh, and the the on the ABC and News Corp have challenged the raids. Uh, the likelihood on on what grounds are being challenged, and I guess the likelihood of that succeeding, which every media organisation would like to see happen, but it might be easier said than done. But I might just get you in a moment, Justin. But uh, thanks. Yeah. It's uh, Matt Dunkley, business editor at the Herald and the Age. Uh, I've got a, a question for Senator Patrick. I just wanted to understand um, there's a tax cut vote looming where your votes will be very crucial. I'm, I'm wondering if that, if um, Mr Boyle's position is a threshold issue for you and deciding which way you'll go on that. In, in general, we try not to uh, mix metaphors. Uh, it, it, you steer into danger when you do. Uh, we will work on the, on the tax cuts uh, on their merits, that legislation on its merits, but there is an underlying need for, uh, for a good relationship with the government and to work in good faith with them. And when we're doing that, we can put things on the table, issues that are of concern to us. Uh, I can tell you, I've already uh, mentioned Richard Boyle to Matthias Cormann as an issue that uh, over the you know, coming months we need to talk about. Uh, yes, we just, I'll, I'll come back to you, I promise. Uh, Ken, Ken Phillips from Self-Employed Australia. Just um, the, the, the whistleblower issue is that classic thing of the state justifies the oppression of an individual because the, the state protects the greater good of all of us. Um, and um, in the extreme, that sort of thought processes winds up in a dictatorship and so the oppression and the death of an individual is justified in terms of the protection of the greater good and so often in this sort of classic sort of debate it's a matter of where we tie the bit where we tie the knot on the string um, in reflecting on the way you've seen the behavior of the ATO towards Richard um, the ATO in Senate hearings and their approach to yourself uh, and the Senate, um, and what's your general impression of the institution of the Taxation Office in terms of, of their uh, transparency, their honesty, their direct answers to questions, in terms of where you see the ATO not being, being tied on that dictatorship line? 
I've uh, questioned the ATO probably about three or four times at estimates over the last uh, 18 months. And indeed, I've had a bit of a conflict with uh, the Commissioner over uh, an order made by the Senate to produce documents uh, that disclosed companies that hadn't filled in their, uh, hadn't filed a tax return, companies that were more than six months late. Uh, and talking about very large companies and large companies in the financial sector. Uh, and that actually uh, ended up with uh, me going through the process of doing one of these subpoenas, an order for production, the tax office resisting for public interest reasons. They state that uh, there are secrecy provisions and that they get their information because of these secrecy provisions. Um, which I don't accept. Um, it's actually, they get this information because people are required to provide it by law. Um, uh, in, in that circumstance where the ATO pushed back, um, the Senate then came and said, well, we don't agree. And ultimately, uh, in, in accordance with our constitution, 60, section 49 of our constitution gives the Senate uh, quite significant powers. Uh, all of the secrecy provisions of various different acts are subservient to section 49 of the constitution because where it sits. Uh, in the end, uh, we forced the tax commissioner to provide uh, that information to the economics committee of, of, the, of, of, the, uh, of the Senate. Um, so there have been issue, times in the past where uh, they have been resistant. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's about training senators more so than, um, yeah, oversight plays a really, really important role. And uh, uh, in, in the case of this documentation that I'm seeking in relation to Richard's uh, public interest disclosure, um, I, I'm quite adamant I'm going to, uh, um, everything I do I have to do with the blessing of, uh, of a majority of the Senate, but assuming I get that majority, um, it won't be wise for the tax commissioner to resist providing that information because it's such important oversight. There's always a competition between the executive and the, the, the legislature who have a, an oversight role uh, and uh, the Senate will always win if it wants to, but it doesn't always want to. Okay, I'll ask uh, for a question here then I might get you to come up, Justin, to talk about the police raids. Yep. Hello, um, Heather Looms from 10 News and the, the Press Club. Um, just wondering, uh, you talk about a referendum, and perhaps this is a question for the, all three of our guests today. Senator, how difficult, first of all, given our, the, the history of referenda in Australia, is it going to be to get not only the media behind you for a press freedom uh, yes vote for um, protections, but the public, given the, the sort of fake news and uh, the hostility that seems to exist around the media these days? I don't underestimate the difficulty of uh, of getting um, a referendum through the parliament. The, the, the process is I need to get the bill to be approved by both the lower house and the upper house. Uh, and then at that point, uh, within two, between two and six months from royal assent, uh, the referendum must occur. And of course, we need a majority of states and a majority of people. Uh, so it is a, a difficult ask and it really comes down to how important the issue is uh, and how well um, uh, I and others in the community sell uh, the importance of media freedom. I might just bring up Justin, if you stand next to uh, Rex and take his microphone. Uh, it's a very important to know the media is pushing back and pushing back strongly in the courts against those police raids on the ABC and Annika Smethurst's house in Canberra, and it does bring in the constitution, uh, Justin. Uh, so I've just explained to the audience, if you can, uh, on what grounds uh, the challenges are, be, are being launched and, legally speaking, uh, what realistically are the chances of, of success? Sure. Uh, Michael, before I do that, can I just say, just having heard um, Richard speak before, I just wanted to say, Richard, thank you for doing the right thing and standing up for what's right. And I'm, I'm really sorry for everything that you're going through and Louise is going through as well. And hopefully everything works out uh, well. And, uh, Rex can uh, pull f the necessary strings. Um, the, the, reason, the reason this discussion as well about whistleblowers is so important, my area of practice is obviously focused on the media entities and the, and the journalists, and the reason this, air, this discussion today about whistleblower protection is so important is because in nearly air, to, to, to journalists and to the media organisations, it's not just because of the willingness of uh, whistleblowers to come uh, come forward. It's also because in nearly every case where there are the raids, the other 
the other week, or um, uh, Harvey McManus, who I uh, acted for many years ago, um, charged and convicted with not uh, revealing a source. In nearly every case that that happens, it's because of uh, an attempt to get at the source get at the whistleblower. So that's why whistleblower protection is so important to journalists and media organisations, because if we had better whistleblower protection, there'd be less inclination to go after them, less inclination to then put uh, journalists in the box. In terms of the constitutional arguments, really it is, um, I guess, built on a line of authority in, um, uh, in defamation cases that says, every, because of compulsory voting, everyone's got an interest in receiving um, information about political matters, and that gives rise to, so the argument goes, an implied right to uh, free speech on political matters. And so any law that goes uh, to undermine that is arguably unconstitutional. So that will no doubt be one of the reasons, one of the reasons why they're going straight to the High Court and um, avoiding all the lower courts. So hopefully Rex can uh, fix that and actually get his uh, legislation up. Fantastic, Justin Quill, thank you so much. Uh, we might have time for one, perhaps two more questions. Uh, yeah, then I'll come to you, I'm, Belinda. In a sec. Yes, one here, then one there. Yep. I'm the one here. Um, Ian Melrose, just a question to the panel in general. What would you think of trying to have legislation introduced that required um, examination, or a court examination verdict, and a verdict on uh, issues that a whistleblower has brought up against a corporation or individual before? the verdict can be made on the whistleblower. That is, there would be a compulsory assessment of the fundamental issue that the whistle has been blown on before the whistleblower could, a verdict could be given on the whistleblower's um, court proceedings or action against the whistleblower. And in that way, the significance of what they have disclosed uh, would likely bear on the uh, any penalty that the court may put on the whistleblower for having broken some law in blowing the whistle, and they might even have the judge might even have the right to then <clears throat> possibly withdraw the charge against the whistleblower after looking at the significance of the crime that was committed by the organisation. Um, it opens a can of worms in situations like Bernard, <coughs> Bernard Cleary and Witness K, because members of the Howard Downer government would have to be put on trial, um, and I couldn't see that happening. But with the ATO, the Small Business Commissioner is apparently looking at over 100 cases against the ATO. If they were successfully actioned by the Small Commissioner, and she was successful with an some or all of those cases, then any judge determining uh, Richard, Richard Doyle's verdict would probably mitigate or, or lessen the, uh, the, the uh, penalty. Over to the panel. Anybody want to buy in? I'll just say that uh, uh, the fact that Richard is now facing prosecution tells me that the the, the laws don't provide enough protection. I, I'd hate to focus uh, the, the, um, the Parliament's attention on dealing with uh, a whistleblower that is in court, trying to, trying to uh, um, uh, offer in some sense a defence or a reason for dismissal. The laws, if we get them right, would make sure Richard was never in a courtroom. That's what we've got to focus on, making sure he never gets uh, uh, pulled into a court because the protections are so strong. Uh, one there, then we'll finish up at the top table and then we'll have to wrap it up. Yep. Just want to switch it on. Belinda Hawkins, slightly tangential but still running on from what you were saying, Senator. What do you think of the allegation from the alleged whistleblower in the Afghan files incident, uh, that uh, it was the way in which ABC published um, examples of the files he submitted, which he willingly says he submitted to them, um, that had him caught out. And he's also allegation that ABC used them in a way that was completely contrary to what he'd intended. 
is there, is there a problem for us in the media if he's right in what he's saying in that? If I follow through the sequence of events uh, in, in this particular instance, we've had someone who's blown the whistle and uh, uh, has been unsuccessful in, uh, in remedying the, the problem that they think exists and then going to the media. Now, I might point out under the corporation's laws that we've just changed, that is allowed if, uh, if there's no uh, re remedy, uh, no action taken, uh, there is a, it is permissible to go to a journalist. And I'll be very curious when we get to the public sector uh, laws and changing that, whether or not uh, people inside government are willing to accept that principle. Uh, that will be very interesting. But we have the whistleblower. Uh, he, blow, he or she blows the whistle. Uh, when a document is handed to a journalist, uh, and this needs to be factored into how we might look at our, our, our media laws moving forward, we must remember that uh, a, a journalist will always have lawyers around, will always have editors around, and they have a responsibility uh, to both the source and to national security as well. Now, in this instance, I, I don't think that... Uh, I think the editors have been... Uh, you know, we're OK in the context of... Um, uh, their, the need to publish because they were significant stories. Uh, they were about emb embarrassment more so than embarrassment for government rather than uh, national security. But, but I think the, the media also does need to be a little bit careful about how they might expose uh, their sources in the way in which they publish information. Uh, when, I, when I deal with people and, uh, and uh, understand people come to my office all the time and 90% you know, of them uh, have some grievance with government or they want to blow the whistle in some way and uh, I'm always mindful as I've done with Richard actually saying Richard um, I'm happy to take up your case and I'll talk to you about how I'm going to do that and uh, uh, you'll have a veto right if you don't like what I'm going to do you can just tell me that and and I think maybe in your space um, maybe uh, some sort of uh, process like that needs to be adopted where um, if, if you have someone that's uh, willing to, to, to uh, be a source, they have at least some control or some say in how uh, the matter has progressed. And one final question. What's that? Oh, yes, Louise, yeah, come, come up. Uh, uh, you, sir, Richard Boyle's now wife. In fact, these two were married only about, what, four weeks ago? It's exactly uh, a month today. Yes, yeah, so congratulations. <laughs> and Thanks. And I, I want to finish uh, where I started with Richard, and you, you, I suppose, I guess more candidly can give the audience an insight into uh, the, the, the stress and the strain and, I suppose, the inner turmoil uh, Richard's good work, his right work, his honest work has, has had on him as a person, as, as a whistleblower. Oh, it's, it's definitely taken its toll on both of us and not just on us, on our families and our friends. Um, but uh, it's, I'm sort of lost for words right now because it's been ongoing and there's no end in sight right now. Um, and that's very hard to take, so. Louise has to, uh, unfortunately, watch me go through a lot of the stress. We had an incredibly beautiful wedding, which, um, as we stated in the 7.30 report that Adele did, you know, a, a welcome relief from the uh, unending stress, the relentless stress. And, uh, you know, we had a beautiful time and a lovely week after, and then it's, um, Adele came over with the crew, and then I sunk into, a, 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 I suppose, another pit of despair, and these come, periodically when you're under such incredible stress from a powerful organisation like the ATO that has a, a, you know, a two or a three billion dollar budget, they have unlimited resources to try and destroy me and it seems like they're trying to do so. Uh, and Louise has like to... like David and Goliath. <laughs> and Louise supports me and, and just uh, helps me through. I get up and help her get off to work. And unfortunately, I'm not, <laughs> not working at the moment. So thanks to Louise for putting up with me and, um, and supporting me through very difficult times. Thanks, Louise. You're worth it. <laughs>
And that is where we end this lunch. And I want to uh, introduce, uh, sorry, thank our guests individually. Uh, Richard, can I personally thank you? Uh, and I, I know I speak on behalf of the room for your, your, your courage and your tenacity. And I know we wish you all the best. We'll be watching you very, very closely with great support as you continue to fight your battle through the courts uh, in your particular case and on behalf of whistleblowers right around the country. So ladies and gentlemen, please thank Richard Boyle. Thanks, Michael. And uh, I just wanted to thank Mark Baker and the Melbourne Press Club um, for their support in having me over. It's been a lovely um, day's break for Louise from work and for me. So it's a, a short break, but very much welcome. And thanks to Adele and Rex for their continued support. And on that front, uh, Adele Ferguson, uh, thank you. Uh, Adele has helped ventilate Richard's story as she has done with so many whistleblowers. Uh, she knows full well the, the plight that Richard uh, and Jeff Morris and other whistleblowers you mentioned have, have gone through, but uh, thank you for joining us. Please thank Adele Ferguson. <laughs> Who also happens to be the president of the Melbourne Press Club and a great president she is too, so thank you. <laughs> And uh, Matthias Cormann's new best friend, Senator <laughs> Rex Patrick. Uh, in all seriousness, thank you so much. I know you're very busy uh, preparing for the resumption of Parliament next week. And I know all of us will be watching very closely and supporting you very strongly on your endeavours when it comes to whistleblower and press freedom legislation in the Senate. So please thank Senator Rex Patrick. And thank you, uh, one of Australia's leading media lawyers. He wasn't too shy after all. Justin Quill, M&K lawyers, for uh, his contribution. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, tell your friends, this uh, video will be up on the Melbourne Press Club website later on, and our podcast is available at your favourite app store. So thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next Melbourne Press Club function. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.